So this is going to be a pretty rapid journey through 300 years in about 45 minutes. Um, thinking a little bit about what we can learn from the past, from the development of the, of the gas networks and how they've evolved over time, and what might happen to them in the future as we move towards a low carbon economy. Um, I have to say at this point particular thanks to Will McDowell and Stephanie Dimbleland who contributed quite a lot of the work that is in this talk. So I'm going to look at it three periods in this talk. So I'm going to kick off looking at about 1800 to 1875, which was really the birth of the gas industry. Uh, I'm then going to move on to the maturation and competition phase, 1875 until the current time, to see, to see how it evolved, particularly when the, the, the big new competitor came on the scene, which was electricity. And then I'm going to, for the last half of the talk, think a bit about the future of gas uh, in the UK, and uh, adoptions for the networks and local economy. So, in 1800, the country was at war. Uh, it was in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. It was a big time of upheaval in the country. But also, it was from a technological perspective, it was the start of a new industry. So, th there was a bunch of people around the country, a bunch of technological pioneers who were th trying to demonstrate gas, who, who believed that gas had a really big future, um, particularly for lighting, and were building demonstration projects. Um, pr pretty rapidly, um, gas became a, a, went from an idea to a reality. So in 1812, the first company was incorporated. And by 1820, most towns and cities in the UK had at least some gas lighting in their centres. A very, very rapid transition. Um, between 1820 and 1860, we had an expansion of the networks and gradual technological improvements in terms of the burners, the, product, the gas production techniques, etc., etc. It's all about 1875 when a new market came around, which is cooking for gas. So let's look at this time period a bit more closely. So why, why was gas important? Why, why were people going for gas? Well, there's two basic reasons. Um, prior to gas, but most streets weren't lit. It, people, the main, the main fuel for lighting was whale oil, and, and it was too expensive for most areas, most towns in the UK, except in the richest parts, so for example, central London. And so, so for the first, the most important thing that gas offered was an economic case. It was about a third of the cost of way oil. But, but secondly, there was also a quality of service in that it had a brighter and a safer flame than, than way oil than use. And so it kind of felt like an idea whose time had come. Now, as in any industry, you had, you had a bunch of pioneers who did important things. So here's one of them. Uh, this is William Murdoch, who lit his house in Redroof. He was a miner, and, and he was a, also a technologist. Uh, the Elon Musk of the day, so to speak, was this guy here called Frederick Windsor, uh, who's standing up. Uh, he, he was a German, and at the time people thought that Germans were very skeptical that Germans knew anything about technology and industry. <laughs> it's changed quite a lot since then. Um, and so the first thing he tried, uh, when people, nobody would listen to him, was to change his name. He anglicized it to Windsor, which sounds very good class these days. That didn't work, and, and so his solution was to set up a gas experiment in a theater in London. So this is the experiment you can see. And, and this is the works where coal is being gasified. And here you have the gas lights up here. Uh, this is Frederick Windsor doing a demonstration. And we, uh, to get around his uh, Germanic origins, he employed a, an English narrator down here who's actually doing all the talking. And, and he was a real businessman, so he was really pushing forward to get the new companies going. And, and in the early years, there were several petitions to start a new company for gas. So I, I, I really love this title in 1807, the New Patriotic Imperial and National Light and Heat Company, which was one, it was one attempt, which was unsuccessful. Um, but it was interesting that people were, even then, thinking about heat as a potential market for gas, not just light. Uh, the first company was actually incorporated in 1812. They all had to go by Act of Parliament at that time. And that was called the Gas, Light and Coke Company, which was a much more accurate description of what it was actually doing. And, and then, of course, um, leading up to that, many more companies were incorporated over the next few years, and we had widespread gas adoption by, 2020, by 1820. Now, in the early days, even then, gas pipes were constru constructed from cast iron, and, and that continued for a long, long time, using iron, until, until the 1970s. Um, as it happened, the Napoleonic Wars came to an end in 2015, which was very nicely timed. There were lots of old muskets available. And so people stitched together all the old muskets, to some extent, to make their gas networks. 
Um, because the leakage was very high, it was necessary to use low pressures. Um, and, and the Coke part of the title of the company um, was, was actually very important because part of the business case came from the byproducts you got from Gaspar and Coal. So you got Coke, ammonia, and coal tar in particular were very valuable commodities <coughs> on top of the gas that they were producing. The gas really caused a social revolution, but perhaps unlike um, more so than most energy technologies that have come to be. Because prior to gas, most areas at night were not lit, but particularly in cities, towns and cities, it was very dangerous to go out at night, so people didn't. Um, except, in the, except in the lit areas, and, and even where there, were, where there were lights, there was very few people who could, the lights were, were fairly dim in comparison. Now when gas came around, you had this brilliant white lighting, and, and it, it became much more widespread than anything that had gone before. And so some, suddenly, a whole new social kind of system came about because people started going out at night and changing their lifestyle patterns in response to this new technology. Uh, here, here's some gas lights in Pall Mall in a cartoon, for example. Now, all, all of the original enterprises for gas were private, but, but public, the public sector did, uh, did start to have a role in a, from 1824, when the first public enterprise was set up in Manchester. And from that time uh, until, until about the 1940s, there was roughly half public and half private uh, enterprises uh, providing gas. Um, at first, gas was, was completely unregulated. People would put in place gas pipes and then they would set, uh, perhaps they would get an, in an income guaranteed from the local authority. They'd agree for a certain number of lights to be lit each year at a certain cost per light. Uh, but for buildings, it was entirely up to the gas companies to make a competitive case to put gas in buildings. However, th this kind of, th this ultra competitive system started having problems and by the middle of the century, in some streets, you had maybe six different companies, all with their own gas pipes going down the same street, which, which was very difficult, which was making life very difficult economically for the companies. It was very hard to make money when there was so much infrastructure being built. Uh, and and it, was a, it, it was seen as a waste economically. And so at that point, we started having regulation of the gas networks. We had the Metropolis Gas Act in 1860, which restricted the pricing, it created the local monopolies, was a really important thing for, uh, for companies. Uh, but with that, it meant there was a restriction on pricing. And also, really importantly, there was an obligation to supply houses, even if it meant being a, some of them were at a loss for the gas companies. Um, and, and actually, from that point, the system looks very similar to what we have today. Um, together with that, there was a gradual access to gas uh, over time. So it started off with public lighting and then very large buildings, and then gradually moved to smaller and smaller buildings mainly from the public sector and then to the private sector. And then from the 1870s, we had the wider adoption of cooking. Some people still didn't like gas. I mean, for, here's an example from 1865 even. So this is a long time into the gas system where people were complaining of having to pay extra taxes to have their local area to keep the local vicar happy. So some things don't change. Looking now from 1875 to the present, it was perhaps lucky that in 1875 this new market appeared for gas, because in 1879 the first street in the UK was lit uh, with electricity. It was mostly street in Newcastle. And the, the year before that, Cragside, the first house in the UK, was lit with electricity as well. And that rapidly led to an electric lighting act in 1882. Now, now despite the emergence of electricity and electric lighting, it didn't really start to become competitive with gas until 1820. Um, and, and not really, not, not, a, not a great deal changed in the gas system until late, until after the Second World War, when the whole system was nationalised in 1948, subsequently to be privatised in 1994. Things go around, go around, uh, and then also in, in the middle of that, there was a huge technical transition as well, when natural gas was discovered in the North Sea, and then pretty soon afterwards, the whole network was converted to use natural gas instead of town gas. It was a huge conversion in a very, very short space of time. Um, so going back to the early 1900s, there was competition from electric lighting, but we have to remember here that gas is an incumbent technology. All of the lamps in, in the cities are, uh, are designed for gas. They all burn gas, they have gas systems set up, all the pipes are there. <coughs> it's very, very difficult for elect electricity to provide competition to that. 
Um, and at the same time, gas, gas markets were, for cooking, were expanding. Occasionally, heating, gas was used for heating too, though that was a very small number of houses because it was quite expensive compared to burning coal directly. But then the gas system was extending. So we, here we have some gas pipes, I think it's in, in Old Kent Road, but I think these ones are still in use. So this, is, this is very old. This is from uh, the, I think it's the 1890s. The number of customers in the gas system increased gradually from 1880 up to the current time, as you can see there. Uh, from about two and a half million to what we have, we currently have about 23 million. <coughs> it's interesting to see how, how electricity actually increased over time. So in the graph on the left hand side here, we have the increase of electricity from almost nothing in 1820, where it's mainly used for industry. Um, to a gradual increase in the residential sector and the service sector in the late years. Um, more useful to compare is, is uh, how electricity and gas are used for lighting, which is shown in this graph. So, so in, in 1920, almost maybe 95% of lighting was still provided by gas. In the intervening 40 years, only 5% of street lighting, public lighting, come from electricity. And, and that kind of continued. So gas continues, although, although electricity is getting a larger share up to 1940, gas is still increasing quite rapidly, gas lighting. Um, this point is the Second World War, as you might imagine, we stopped lighting the house, the streets. And then afterwards, gas, gas uh, and electricity both came back online in a big way, right up until about 1950. And at that point, gas lighting started to be replaced on a large scale electricity. But it wasn't until about 1970 that the majority of gas lights have been replaced by electricity. So we're talking about a really, really long transition here. 40 years for electricity to get any sort of foothold and 80 years to actually convert the, the system from gas to electricity. And I, th I think that's really important because if we go back to the early days, the gas lighting industry developed in only 10 years. So we had the first company in, in 1812, and by 1820 we had lighting in many of the towns in the UK. And it's, it spread pretty rapidly after that. But of course, prior to that there was no lighting, so it provided a really important new service, and there was a clear business case for gas compared to alternatives. But on the contrary, for electricity, technology demonstrations took 40 years before, ele before electric lighting came on stream, because gas at first was cheaper, while the electricity technologies were improving which took quite a long time, uh, because the existing incumbent, which is gas, provided a similar service to electricity, so there was already lighting there, and uh, it, it had all of the infrastructure in place for that. And, because, and al although electricity could compete on quality, uh, electric lighting was considered better than gas lighting, and so the, the great and the good um, had electric lighting to show up in their houses, um, it, wasn't it couldn't compete on price, which is important for the public sector. So thinking a bit about post-war reconstruction, uh, restructuring of the industry, we had privatization in 1948, and so we took about, I can't remember, 300, a few hundred gas companies, and uh, both municipal ones and private ones, and we stuck them all together in one great pot, and turned them into 12 area boards, which are overseen by a gas council. But, but this, I mean, one might argue that this had no real change for the gas networks or for the consumers involved until the introduction of natural gas. Perhaps the biggest change for consumers was that the government was setting prices rather than the private sector. And so electioneering comes into play and such like. Um, the introduction of natural gas. Uh, natural gas was actually introduced um, in order to support the town gas system, the manufactured gas system. Um, so that, and the original idea was to bring it in by liquefied natural gas by ship. So the first shipment was in 1959 uh, to Canby Island. So there's a picture of the new plant here. And, and a, a small new transmission system was planned and built to take that gas to the major, uh, the major population areas of Britain. And, and the idea was that the natural gas would be mixed with the town gas to get it to the right calorific value, uh, particularly because there's new town gas manufacturing technologies that were coming on stream, uh, which, which produced a different quality of gas than to what they'd had previously under the old But, also in 1959, natural gas was discovered off the North Sea. 
And so suddenly people thought, wait a minute, there's an awful lot of gas sitting just on our doorstep, and, it, and actually using this will be much cheaper than using town gas, what we're currently doing. <coughs> so pretty quickly the idea came around that, well, maybe we should convert the whole system to use natural gas instead of town gas. So we want to think a little bit about what that meant. First of all, in 1965, there was a demonstration project. The, the obvious place to put it was Canby Island, where we had the LNG terminal, so if it was unsuccessful, we could continue providing natural gas to that island, even if the rest of the system continued to use more town gas. So we did that. In 1966, after the review of Canby Island, there was a decision made to convert the whole network to the natural gas. That's, that program started in 1967. Uh, the first region was finished in only seven years, and, a and after ten years, the entire network had been converted to use natural gas instead of town gas. And that's quite, quite amazing, really, when you consider the amount of things that, the, the amount of changes that had to be, that were required to actually convert the networks. Because we had, we had to, it, it wasn't just a case of changing over the gas that goes into the pipes. Um, we had to do centralized training and conversion teams because every single appliance that used gas in the country needed to be changed. So every single town, every single house in the country had to be visited in order to make those changes. So the, the conversion teams we got, uh, uh, were put together. There was conversion kits produced for every single appliance in the country. Uh, there was a pre-conversion visit to every household to see what gas appliances they actually had so they could plan uh, uh, the conversion. And then in a single day, they would isolate a particular area, a few streets, and the team would go in and change every single house, all of the, every set of replies in every single house in that area. And that continued over a, a time period of 10 years across the country in parallel, uh, until the whole country being converted to natural gas. And in parallel to, the, to these activities, the new high pressure gas transmission network was built to, to move natural gas around the country from the North Sea to the cities. Um, this, is, this is a map showing you how quickly the transmission network was built. So we, we think these days, we wonder these days about how quickly we build <coughs> new infrastructure, uh, for example, electricity part, uh, infrastructure or hydrogen pipelines or whatever. <coughs> but well, start, we, had, we had the initial pipe network to take liquefied natural gas to the main gas terminals here in 1966. But then pretty rapidly, this was expanded across the country uh, to, to bring in gas from the import <coughs> terminals from the North Sea here, 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 and here, and to take it across the whole country. So it was about, it was about 3,000 miles of building in just over 10 years. So it's pretty, pretty quick how you can build these things if you really need to. Another problem we had is that under the original town gas, which was manufactured from coal, we had very, very local networks. So th th these networks were designed so you had a coal works, with, on, on the edge of the city, and then, you, and then you had a bunch of pipes from that network um, supplying only that city or that town. But none of these networks were interconnected. And, and this, this was fine for, as long as you had the local manufacturing facility, but as soon as you had natural gas, you then needed to supply gas from a central point <coughs> to all areas. And that, and that meant interconnecting all of these originally separate, uh, instead of having hundreds of little separate networks, we had to interconnect them all to make one big network. Um, connecting them to the, to the transmission network I, I just showed. And you, and you can see what effect that had on this graph. So here's the number of customers along here, and this is the total length of the pipelines in the distribution networks up here. And so, and so you see it's fairly, uh, fairly um, linear curve here, and then suddenly it shoots upwards. So the number of customers is almost unchanged, and the total length of the pipelines increases greatly. This is the time, this is the time of conversion here. And then we get back to the old trend again, once conversion is completed. So there's a huge amount of interconnection involved. Uh, the cost of conversion is quite interesting. So there's a number of elements, including North Sea gas extraction infrastructure to actually get the gas out of the North Sea. Uh, we had to build the National Transmission Network, although we were doing some of that anyway. It ended up being much bigger because of the natural gas transition. Uh, we had to upgrade and replace appliances. We had to upgrade the distribution networks and interconnect them all. Uh, we had, we had uh, the loss of gas works assets uh, to actually manufacture the gas. And then we had indirect costs such as central heating infrastructure, although they provided a, a, an important service compared to what the heating systems that people had previously, gas fire, or coal fires in the houses. Uh, interestingly, by far the biggest cost in all of this was the loss of the gas <coughs> works assets. I think that was about two thirds of the total cost. 
was just writing down um, the value of those assets. <coughs> so it was, a, it was, it was the, the cost of the stranded infrastructure, so to speak. These graphs show you how gas consumption evolved over time during its conversion. So in, in this graph on the left, you can see town gas in blue, and you can see natural gas in red. Um, and so town gas, gas was consumption was fairly, this is across the whole economy, by the way, in all sectors. Town gas consumption <coughs> was fairly flat up until the 1960s, 1965. It started increasing a little bit then. Um, in fact, it had almost doubled by this point in 1970. But following natural gas coming on stream, suddenly gas use exploded here, all the way up here. <coughs> and and that, that curve is shown on here. So it, it continued to explode to increase uh, in, from 1990 onwards when electricity came online. So in, in the early days, it was mainly domestic, over here, for lighting and for cooking, uh, with a bit of service and a bit, uh, as well for, for lighting. And then suddenly industry gets involved here, following natural gas coming on stream, and then electricity here. This bit at the top here is mainly the, the oil and gas industries themselves, extraction industries. But, and, that and that great increase in gas use was caused by heating. So the, the new market that emerged, because natural gas was cheaper, was, was the ability to heat people's houses using gas instead of coal. And so this graph shows the domestic graph gas consumption per customer per year, which is pretty flat until about 1960, and suddenly it shoots upwards. This is cooking and for a while lighting, and this is heating. So it was, it was really quite a transformation that nat the natural gas conversion produced, both, uh, not, not just in terms of what happened to the networks, but in terms of how we used gas and how we provided energy services in the UK. So that's the history part over. If I think a little bit now about the future of gas, um, and, and the main challenge we have at the minute is greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we can see how gas, natural gas has increased in use since 1970 here. And it's now a big chunk of our current energy system, maybe about a quarter to a third of all of, all of the final energy consumption in the UK. And that's for heating in homes and industry. But this is where we are now at the moment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, <coughs> and this is where we've mandated to go in 2050. You know, this is a very approximate CO2, non CO2 split, which changes depending on who you ask as to how, how much uh, you can reduce non CO2 emissions. Uh, let's do greenhouse gas emissions. And, and so what, what's clear is we really have to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions across the UK economy, and it's going to be quite difficult having this much gas in there if we're going to do so. And so decarbonisation is, is, is really a, a threat to the gas networks. And so if we think about scenarios for the future, I want to think about two very broad scenarios, which are heat transition and decarbonised gas. Uh, the first one I'll talk, I'll talk about is heat transition. And the outcome of all UK decarbonisation studies, pretty much that I've seen, has been electric heat pumps, biomass boilers, and district heating. Um, I've been given an example here from the government's strategic framework on heat in the UK in 2012. Uh, that's since been superseded by, uh, by a heat strategy in 2013. Um, Interestingly, the one in 2012 had no role for gas, and the one in 2013 was much more circumspect, um, because one of the big issues is having stranded assets, and the gas system would, would be a huge stranded asset. Um, but, but it's pretty important that low carbon buildings are, are considered a very important part of the government's carbon plan, and, and so the role of gas in the future is a bit uncertain. The reason that the, re the reason that we have these forecasts for, for very little gas in the future, for decarbonisation, are from model results like these. And th these ones, are, I've, I've picked out two random ones here, it's not really important um, exactly what this says. These, these are meant as examples. Um, so I took these two from the UK Markel model, which is an energy systems model, which looks at how you can decarbonise the economy over decades in the cheapest possible way, which is the least cost, op so least cost optimization model. Uh, in this one here, which is a, a, a deck scenario from uh, Forbes et al. 2011, which is for, carbon, for, for various carbon budget studies, we can, we can see gas use here coming down and then falling to zero by 2050. 
and this is heat produced by low gas appliances, taking over taking over percent. Here's a similar scenario, also from the same model, but with the revised residential heat sector. And in this one, we have gas mainly uh, having most of the market up here. At the moment, and by the, by the end of the century, by 2050, it has a very small role, but it, still, it does still have a role in heat provision in houses that can't use heat pumps or district heating or systems. So, two, two things, two kind of, not right, two, two, two low carbon scenarios, long term low carbon scenarios that suggest a very small or, or low role for gas in the future. But this produces a bunch of issues that we need to think about in terms of abandoning the gas networks. So one issue is that we have a nine major replacement program at the moment for health and safety reasons where we're replacing all iron, main, all iron gas mains within 30 meters of the building with polyethylene, plastic gas pipes. And, and that, that, system, that program is continuing, um, and it's currently due to finish in about 2034 when, when we'll have upgraded the entire gas system. And then according to previous results, we might shut down the whole system a few years later. Kind of crazy. Um, there's a question about compensation for the, um, for the people who currently own the gas networks. So you've essentially got a very long, large stranded asset. It has a very long lifetime. Um, we don't really know how long plastic pipes last because we haven't been using them for long enough. But the, the oldest ones that are currently in use are still fine in the, in the Netherlands. Um, and these companies support these assets in good faith. And so there's a question about whether they would be, for example, uh, receive some sort of compensation if they were forced to shut them down due to climate change reasons as opposed to other economic reasons. There's a question about how we actually decommission the gas networks because we're not really sure, we, don't, we haven't really done that on a large scale. We're not sure exactly what would be required, how high the costs would be, who would pay for it, etc. And I think there's also questions about fuel poverty. So our, our, main, our main strategy at the moment for reducing fuel poverty is actually to connect more people to the gas networks. Uh, and in the future, if we're going to, sh if we're going to shut down the gas networks and, and, and use more expensive forms of heating, then that could have a really important impact on fuel poverty. Of course, we're probably decades away, and the economy could change quite a lot in that time, but it's something we need to think about. So the second option that we have, which I'm going to spend a bit of time on, is decarbonizing gas. And three different technologies I want to talk about briefly. Uh, bio biosynthetic natural gas, so producing natural gas from uh, biomass. Uh, hydrogen injection and hydrogen conversion. And I want to think a little bit about which options are cost optimal and which ones are technically feasible. BioSNG is an existing technology. We already use it. We can produce gas from sewage, from landfill <coughs> gas, from anaerobic digestion on farms, or from biomass gasification. Um, and we already do it from uh, sewage in a small way, particularly <coughs> from anaerobic digestion. So quite a few anaerobic digestion plants are currently coming on stream at the moment, mainly on farms and mainly using maize as a fuel. There's no technical impediment to mixing bio-SNG in the UK gas system. Uh, it is necessary to add some biopropane and to clean up the biogas that you first get to remove uh, a bunch of contaminants and water and such like um, in, in order to upgrade the biomethane. Uh, and it's actually a big part of the government's targets for the renewable heat incentive. Uh, so it's expected, it has been planned that it would generate 15% of the total UK renewable heat, which is actually a very big chunk. And, that, and that's aimed at meeting the EU's 2020-2020 targets, renewable targets. There are a bunch of longer term issues with bio-SNG though. So waste is quite a limited resource um, if we want to use sewage to produce bio-SNG, which might be one of the best ways. Um, Producing it from bio crops is more expensive than waste, often. It needs to be from a sustainable source, which, is, uh, which has been a difficulty. So for example, David Mackay had a report about using American wood, which thought was, it wasn't very sustainable. There's a lot of food versus fuel issues that people will bring up. And it's also questionable about whether it's actually the best use of biomass. Uh, some people think the best use might be, for example, the burden, stick all of the carbon underground using CCS. Um, and so it might be quite an inefficient use of biomass to use it for biomethane, bio-SNG. So thinking of moving on to hydrogen injection, 
This is where we inject a small amount of hydrogen to the existing gas stream. So we have a mix of natural gas and hydrogen. It partially decarbonizes the gas stream, which is good. It supports renewables through power to gas. And so what this means is that at times of high supply and low demand for electricity, we use the excess electricity from renewables to, uh, to produce hydrogen, and then we dump that into the gas networks. So it's kind of energy storage. Um, we have there's some issues. Currently, you have to, uh, the amount of hydrogen you're allowed in the gas system is under 1%. I think it might, might actually be 0.1%. It's very, very low um, from gas regulations that were set in the 1960s. So that would need to be changed in the future. The, what the technical limit is is uncertain. So some people have said 3%, some said 5%, 10%, 20%. To some extent, it depends on your, on your appliances. Because as, as you make your gas appliances more efficient, you also become less tolerant for changes in the gas quality. And so less tolerant to uh, adding hydrogen. It, it looks like it might be economically viable soon. Uh, a couple of projects have been looking at it. Uh, the Grid Gas Project, which was a, a TSP funded project, and HI, which is an EPSRC project. But, I mean, quite importantly in all of this, it can only really make an a small overall contribution to decarbonisation because you can <coughs> inject enough into the gas network to make it worthwhile continuing to use large amounts of natural gas. Which means that in the longer term you would be forced to reduce the amount of natural gas and since you have, you, the hydrogen has to be a fixed proportion, it's restricted to a fixed proportion of natural gas, it's all, only ever going to be very small in the long term. So it's a, it's a useful technology perhaps for coping with renewables, particularly in the short term, but in the longer term it's not going to have a big impact. So let's think a little bit about hydrogen conversion. Um, and so this is another run from the same model that I showed before. And this is an inter this is this fits the interesting part on this slide because this is fuel cell micro CHP running on hydrogen, as opposed to and we have natural gas ceasing by 20. <coughs> so so essentially we have a hydrogen flow where we uh, where we have natural gas, and that and that's a that's an at least cost economic result. Um, I call this Newtown gas, uh, hydrogen, which is a pure flow of hydrogen. Uh, the original town gas actually had about 50% hydrogen in it. It was composed of about 50% hydrogen. Hydrogen has a different calorific value and flame speed, um, a similar Wobby index to natural gas, which means that you would, again, have to change all of the appliances in the country if you wanted to use a hydrogen flow. And so we have the same issues that we had previously when we moved from town gas to natural gas, which is why it's such an interesting to look at, but I would argue it's more complex because the gas networks are now more complex and more integrated, so it's much harder to actually isolate part of the network and to convert that part and then move, gradually go through the network in that manner. And also the gas, because the gas industry is more fragmented now, we don't have a single nationalized industry, <coughs> we have a privatized industry, and so it needs to be centrally coordinated somehow. Uh, there's a whole bunch of safety and operational issues with it. Um, we're not sure how much it would cost to convert houses. I've got estimates from 500 to 3,500 pounds per house, which can make a huge difference. Um, it's questionable about to what extent we'd have to change the gas distribution networks to use hydrogen, and what the pipeline construction costs of a hydrogen transmission network would be in order to get the hydrogen moving around the country in a similar way to gas at the moment. But also there's questions about how we'd actually manage the transition to hydrogen. And if we wanted to do it at some point in the future, how do we actually need to, what do we need to do now in order to keep the option for, for conversion open? Because it's not something I don't think we can do in a very short space of time. It's something that needs 10 to 20 years of planning. We looked at the technical capability <coughs> with a bunch of interviews. Um, and I've actually put the wrong, this is actually Dodds and Damon Lab. This is the wrong uh, citation down here. I've got the right one at the end. So we talked to some public sector, industry, and academic people. And, and we asked them what they thought the issues would be with conversion to hydrogen. Um, it's interesting to look at the different types of pipes in the gas network that you have to deal with. So we have high, high strength steel pipes, so the high pressure ones. They can't take hydrogen, uh, the steel is too hard. Uh, they, tend, they tend to rupture has potential for rupturing. For the lower pressure pipes in the distribution networks, you have a mixture of steel and iron and copper for the pre-1970. 
and you have various types of polyethylene plastic pipes since 1970. Um, and that actually is most of the network. So we have a very small transmission network in comparison to the high pressure distribution, and certainly in comparison to the low pressure distribution. We have 200,000 kilometers of pipeline, 250,000 kilometers of mini pipes linking, uh, linking that, uh, the buildings. And so if we want to convert the system, we need to think about all of these different types of pipes and how, where they are and how we deal with the different pipes in different ways. We need to think about the compressor stations. Um, and we, we, we thought that piston compressors should probably work fine, the existing ones with hydrogen, but centrifugal compressors, because they depend on the gas volume and the volumetric flow rate, would probably need to be changed in our <coughs> However, you'd probably need to re redesign your compressors anyway because they wouldn't work, the even the piston ones wouldn't work very efficiently with hydrogen. You'd probably rebuild them. But that, that's only really an issue for the high pressure networks. Um, for low pressure networks, in the pressure reduction station, <coughs> natural gas cools on expansion, but hydrogen tends to heat up. And so it's a question about whether you'd need to add cooling where previously we didn't need it. Safety issues include the level of confinement of hydrogen. Um, if the hydrogen leaks out of the pipe, then we have to think about whether where's it going to go to. Is it going to go to someone's house? And once it gets into the house, is there then going to be an explosion risk? So it leaks in a different way to natural gas and tends to accumu accumulate in a different way to natural gas. Um, it's important that we can detect hydrogen prior to ignition and once it, it has been ignited in order to avoid injuries. Um, that's pretty hard by the eye because the flames are invisible. And and it's quite different. What we really need is a, is a high quality but low cost sensors in order to use hydrogen. Uh, we need to think about the tolerability of hydrogen ignition and explosion relative to natural gas. Um, one issue is that it's, it's arguably no more dangerous than natural gas, but it's, da it's dangerous in different ways to natural gas. So it tends to accumulate and explode in different ways at different temperatures and different concentrations of air. And, and so those issues have to be got around. Uh, one of the issues with, one of the potential issues with hydrogen injection is that if you mix hydrogen and natural gas together, you get the, the worst of both worlds in terms of safety. And then we have to think a little bit about public acceptance for, for hydrogen. Operational issues for the, actual, for the gas networks themselves include the energy carrying capacity of hydrogen. Um, in terms of how much energy will actually go through the network, it's about 20% lower than natural gas. Um, that could become an issue, particularly if we started using micro CHP, because the amount the gas use would actually increase over what we have at present. We'd be generating electricity in people's houses as well as generating heat. <coughs> and line pack storage, which is line pack storage, is the amount of storage you have within the gas system itself. So not, normally we have quite a lot of storage with the, with the gas pipes acting as a buffer. Now, one of the issues with hydrogen is that it's got a much lower energy density, but it flows four times faster. And that means you have a much lower amount of hydrogen, a lower amount of energy within the gas system than you would do with natural gas for any one time, which could be an important for buffering the system and operating the system in the future. Uh, these are a few results from a paper that looked at hydrogen conversion of the gas networks. Um, and th this, is a, this is at least cost optimization results. So it's looking at what, what amount of hydrogen is optimal but for domestic heating in the future, in 2050. And this is, this is along here we have the cost of, of actually converting the gas networks, where 100% is building new networks, and long it means I've used the existing networks with no changes. Um, and so, so what we find is that with no CO2 constraint, you could actually use a little bit of hydrogen if the cost of conversion were low, and you could make your hydrogen very cheaply. Now, it, that, that actually assumes we're making hydrogen out of coal with no CCS. So it's, it's a counterfactual, but it's not very helpful. But what's really useful to see is the uh, runs with the CO2 constraint, so we're reducing CO2 emissions by 80% in 2050. Uh, and we find that up to about 550 petajoules per year of um, heating could be provided by hydrogen in the future, compared with the current about 1,000, 1,200 or so. so. So that's still quite a bit of heat. So, so there is some economic potential under certain circumstances for hydrogen conversion to work. Uh, this is a sensitivity study, so the blue lines are the same as the ones that we saw before, uh, with about 550 petajoules. 
And the green line and the red lines show what happens if we have either high micro CHP costs, so the actual cost of putting in the buildings are higher than we assumed in the first run, or the, or the cost of heat pumps are higher than we assumed in the first run. If, if the micro CHP costs are high, then it reduces the amount of micro CHP that's used by, not by much. If the heat pump costs are high, then suddenly we have a switch from heat pumps to micro, to micro CHP with hydrogen. So, so there, is a, there is potentially a, a bit of um, some, flip, some flipping point behavior, some switching behavior between the two technologies, depending on the cost assumptions that you make. And a lot of that data is very uncertain, as I talked about earlier. So. It's very much more research required. Uh, this one, I'll, I'll just talk very quickly, is about the marginal cost of electricity. So it's looking at the, what the impact of actually having micro CHP generating electricity in people's houses at peak times for heat, which, is, which are also peak times for electricity, and what, what, those, what the impacts of those have on the electricity system and the electricity price. And what we find is if we have a lot of micro CHP, so in the high heat pump case, so we have few heat, fewer heat pumps and more micro CHP, the price of electricity uh, drops by an awful lot, down to about six pence per kilowatt hour from around 15 pence per kilowatt hour. So, so it can have quite wide, it, it could potentially have quite wide system consequences using micro CHP. I want to finish off talking a little bit about research challenges for the gas system, what I think they are. So one person told me the gas network hasn't really generated a lot of interest from academia. There's not a lot of fundamental research to be done. Uh, was the quote I had. Um, and so I disagree a bit, as you might imagine. And so the, here's the research, some of the main research issues I think there are. There's quite a few issues around the trans transition to a low carbon, low carbon economy, um, about whether the gas system is still viable with the great, greatly reduced gas consumption, if we go down to the 200 petajoule case with a small number of houses using gas, or perhaps using gas as a top up for electricity, peak times. If we, if we did decide to abandon the gas system, what are the technical issues around that? What's the issues around regulation, compensation, and such like around that? How do we actually do it? If we want to use bioSNG, what's the cost of going to be of that? What's the availability in terms of food against fuel? And how would we actually incorporate it in, into the system? Where could we do it? Um, one, of, one of the issues we have with bioSNG and with shale gas, which is the next one, is, is that it tends to be produced in the countryside it's done on farms or shale gas tends to be in the countryside. And actually, if you look at the maps of our gas networks, they're very, very centered around towns. We have, we have very few pipes going through the countryside. Um, and so, that, so it's a real issue if you suddenly have gas production sites coming on stream a long way outside of urban areas, about how you actually inject the gas into those urban areas. But particularly for shale, if you're producing a lot of gas, then how do you, how do you get it into the grid? Because you probably can't put it into the national transmission network you probably, it won't be coming at a high enough pressure at a high enough quantity in one place to do that. And so you probably have to put it into a distribution system and then perhaps you t your distribution system turns into a two-way system where you're pushing gas upwards towards the transmission system in some regions as well as a, uh, coming, de coming down from the national transmission system to the distribution that we do at present. So it's quite a different way of operating the system. Uh, for shale gas, we need to think a little bit, as well, as well as thinking about location, about how we inject into the networks, we need to think about gas quality. Uh, fuel poverty, I think, is an issue. And whether, um, at the moment, we do increase the number of people using gas for fuel poverty reasons, but we tend to do it in urban areas where those people live quite close to a gas system. Uh, and if they're more than a certain distance away, then the, ga the gas operators are not allowed to extend the system to new areas. And, and so there's a question about whether, for example, a village could be, some villages in the countryside could be connected and that cost could be socialized across all of the houses in that village, which is currently not allowed, but it might be an interesting idea in the future. Um, another thing I haven't talked about so far, but I think is interesting, is, is the market for transport, uh, particularly for uh, heavy goods vehicles and perhaps buses, uh, and whether we could start using compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas in the future in the transport sector instead of oil. Perhaps, perhaps only as a transition fuel, but still, it's something that people are thinking about. And the final one is smart meters. Uh, um, everybody in the country is due to get a smart meter by 2020, and we have an awful lot of information coming online and uh, from those meters, and potentially a lot of opportunities to do interesting things around demand for those meters. Um, and so 
I think it would be quite interesting to explore the possibilities there. Some relevant projects that are ongoing are an ETI gas factors project, which is looking at future scenarios for the gas networks, although it probably won't publish the final results. I don't think in public domain. Um, there was a paper, a white paper, on the use of hydrogen and fuel cells for heating. That was published last year by a team here, which you can get on the internet. Uh, it was published by the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Supergen Hub, which is uh, a research conglomerate for hydrogen and fuel cell researchers in the UK. Uh, there's an EPSRC funded project, research council project, called Hydrogen's Value in the Energy System, the Hype project, which is about hydrogen in, um, injection and hydrogen conversion to the gas networks, looking at how it might be done and what the issues are. And there is the H21 CityGate project, I think, which isn't necessarily going to be funded, um, which is currently being proposed. And, that's the, and the idea of that is to look at the technical and economic feasibility of converting the whole city of Leeds to use hydrogen instead of natural gas. <coughs> so, my overall conclusions are that the gas system in the industry has seen many changes over the last couple of centuries. I think it's interesting to note that the technical, technological revolutions can happen really very quickly where there's a clear business case and a clear benefit to come around. So, so we had 10 years to get gas lighting on stream. And that happened both publicly and privately. It was initially funded privately and then publicly. But when electricity came around, um, when there wasn't a clear business case and there wasn't a, a, clear, a clear benefit, the transition to electricity was electric lighting was very slow. Um, the there's been quite a lot of changes within the gas systems over time, which have been driven by markets, by sources, particularly na uh, North Sea natural gas, by legislation and by novel technologies coming on stream. Um, there's been hydrogen conversion is one option for the future. Um, it could actually be the most economic method of satisfying heat demand in the long term, but I think there's a bunch of difficulties with hydrogen conversion, including a natural, uh, the issue of needing to plan a national conversion program, the need to address the safety concerns, um, the need to address the operational concerns about capacity and storage, and what, what actions we actually need to take now um, in order to keep the option open for the future. Because certainly one of the conclusions of our white paper last year that I talked about, was that if you didn't take proactive action now, if the government didn't take pro proactive ac action, then this, this would be an option that wouldn't be available in the future. Um, if you're interested in further reading, then these two books are quite good. Uh, these slides are going online, I think, afterwards, so if you want to look them up, you can. Um, and there's also several papers that I've talked about, the results in, the models in, if you're more interested in those. So please do have a look. Thank you very much for listening. You clearly actually talk about how, how this uh, gas industry in UK world and how where it was used actually from lighting, cooking, then it comes to heating, then in the future how we can actually what we can do with this gas, then how we can actually decarbonize the gas with the biogas and biomethane, then hydrogen, then issues related to hydrogen operational safety and everything. Then you also touch a bit on these research issues and also as you said uh, this uh, Gas can be used in transport sectors. I think in Southeast Asia, many, many, many countries, many taxis and cars nowadays run with CNG converted run. That is another, another area actually for gas is to use. Now the floor is, floor is open for questions. Please, please uh, say who you are and where, where are you? and your affiliation. Then you may ask the question. Please make the question very short. Yeah. Yes, gentlemen. Hi. I'm from Imperial College London. My name is Chris Anderson. Uh, I work at the Sustainable Gas Institute. Um, uh, I guess you've probably heard this question many times before. Where are you getting your hydrogen from for this? Um, I think it's mainly from fossil fuels and CCS. So probably coal in the model. Maybe a bit of gas in some scenarios, but mainly coal because it's much cheaper. Okay. Very small amount. Electrolysis uh, tends to be very small. Yeah, gentlemen, there and next. Yeah. Yeah. And Bell Deck. And just to see the widespread use of fuel cells rather than just hydrogen condensing boilers in the atlas. Could you t uh, talk a bit more about um, how the costs of the two compare? Right, so, so 
was quite a complex trade-off between the two. So the, the model did include both technologies, <coughs> boilers and microCHP. Uh, boilers are assumed to be the same price as gas boilers. MicroCHP is a lot more expensive. And, and so, so from memory, the, the actual the tipping point between the two technologies, between which is, is, is uh, the cost optimal, actually depends on how much electricity costs to produce in the wider electricity system. So it's not actually a question of heat and hydrogen at all. It, de it depends on what, what costs you assume for the future for, for wind turbines and everything else within, the, within a low carbon electricity system. Um, and so in, in a more recent model that we have, where we've got updated electricity costs, which are more expensive than in that model that I, I showed there, we tend to get hydrogen boilers and we don't get micro CHP. But it, it does also depend on what assumptions you make for the micro CHP cost, because they, they're highly uncertain. Um, they've been dropping a lot over the last few years, but they're still very expensive, and they would need to drop by a factor of three to get down to a competitive level. And to what extent that's possible or likely to happen, it's hard to say. Okay, the gentleman in front. Uh, Mike Kelsman from Planet Hydrogen. For the last 15 years, in the pages of the International Journal of Hydrogen Energy, you would see various proposals for splitting methane so that we don't draw off the carbon as carbon dioxide with black carbon, which of course can be safely sequestered with a very big energy loss. Uh, the first company to do this was Cavalry in Norway. Has this come into your horizon in looking at everything? Yeah, so kind of electric spark system. Sorry? Um, I have heard of it, yes. We don't have it in the model, um, I should say, so, uh, for disclosure. I, I've heard of that system to reduce class carbon, um, black carbon. It's very expensive, it uses a lot of electricity, um, and it's very laboratory based at the moment. And, and as things stand, it would be very difficult to actually put a cost on it, which is why we don't have it. Um, but it's, it is something I've heard of. Is it worth further academic interest, do you think? Um, it's hard to say. Um, I, I'm not really sure without looking at the numbers. But perhaps if, if somebody sat down and tried to do a business case of it, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Caverna have done so. And, and obviously there is one company out there that thinks it's worth, worth pursuing. Um, it might depend on whether the black carbon can be used for anything else. If it, if it has a side use, then the byproduct might make the system worthwhile. I mentioned black carbon simply because it can be sequestered and doesn't have to go back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide yeah. as a safety and climate issue. Okay, uh, you didn't mean that at the back, we have that guy. My name's Mark, I'm a renewable energy Paul, have you considered purely synthetic natural gas? That's where you take carbon dioxide from the air and use hydrogen from electrolysis and that is then injected into the gas system. The Germans are looking at it at the moment, and Audi is a plant which they're using for a thing called the e-gas car. And there's no technical limits to that whatever, so they, they're using electricity from wind in the North Sea. Yeah, um, we don't have it in our model. We are putting it into our new model, actually, uh, the methanation system, but we, have, we, don't have it in the, we don't have it in the model results I showed here. But one of the big issues is you're still burning, you're still burning methane at the end, so you're still putting more carbon dioxide back in, in the atmosphere. So, so it is carbon neutral, but it's quite an expensive way of getting to carbon neutral. And from that perspective, if you could sequester the carbon, it would be worth, worth so much more. Um, we find in these models that any, any sort of atmospheric carbon sequestration is, is extremely, if it can be done for a certain price, it, it's extremely valuable to the model because the models, by the time you get to an 80% reduction in CO2 emissions, the model's re really getting quite restricted as to what it can do in terms of where it can make cuts. There's, there's a certain number of, of emissions that are very, very difficult to cut. And so if you have an atmospheric carbon sequestration system, it's kind of a get out of jail free card in, in, a, in terms of actually meeting your energy system targets. So, so that, that, that would be where I think it's most likely to work. Um, we thought about it before, but we are putting it in the new model, but from what we've seen, it's probably not the to do it. Okay, I have a question. Actually, you, you showed in those scenarios like how gas would be no use or little use in 2050. Yeah. Then again, for the hydrogen to come up with CCS in terms of production. So, do you think if bio CCS is successful and you can result in negative, negative emission, then actually gas can play a 
gas consumption could be similar to current level of half of this, not kind of more, little more CO2 in 2050, it could be slightly increased. Yeah, so we, we did look at that in one of the papers, the gas network paper, we, we looked at, you know, we tried to find a scenario where we continued looking, using gas at the current rates in, the, in domestic properties. Everyone likes gas, gas is cheap, gas boilers are great and small, they're quiet, they have a high power output. Um, and we found you could do it, but you really needed to cut everywhere else a lot, or, as you say, as you say atmospheric sequestration technologies. But there, there is an argument, if you do have a high enough level of atmospheric sequestration, that you might just continue using gas. You know, because it's, the, it's almost the last sector you will decarbonize, because it's one of the most expensive sectors to decarbonize. So all, all transport, electricity, and such like will be decarbonized before you get to residential gas use. Um, when there are the comparison with the development of the gas networks and the electricity networks in the UK with the hydrogen, uh, carbon hydrogen and alternative vapors networks, um, uh, what do you think is a more, um, the reflects more the current situation? Um, the political development of the, I mean, of the political regulation or the technology readiness? In terms of what, what do you think of the barriers? Yes. What, what sorts of barriers to the use of uh, hydrogen? Yes. Okay. Um, I just thought at the minute it's mainly been um, th There's a bunch of regulations for using the gas networks. So, we, so I talked about the, the limit on the amount of hydrogen. And, and, and pretty quickly you'll, hit, you'll start to hit a technological limit in terms of your appliances. You could probably go to 3%. Uh, and given the amount of hydrogen we're likely to use in, in the next few years for renewables and such like hydrogen injection, you're not going to get anywhere near three percent. And potentially, you could go higher than that if you selected your sites by care. So, for example, if, if you have a big pipe that's going straight to a gas turbine in the electricity plant, and you inject the hydrogen into there, it will then all disappear down to the same place. And as long as your turbine can take a high level of hydrogen, it's fine. You can go much higher than the three percent or the twenty percent or whatever. So, so with a little bit of clever planning, you might be able to get it to much higher levels. Um, but it's not even able to do so at the moment. We have time for another two or three questions. Now, Paul Eakins, thanks, Paul. It's really a really nice overview. Um, one of your final slides was that um, unless we do something, uh, we won't keep this option open for the gas system. But I wasn't clear precisely what it was you were suggesting that we should do in order to keep it. So, so there's quite a lot of planning involved in actually converting the gas networks. Um, for, for example, if we want to, if, if we need to do particular changes to the distribution system in order to accommodate hydrogen instead of natural gas from a technological perspective, the ideal time to do it would be when we're doing the iron major placement program. So, so to build it into that program as it goes along, so that the, the network is hydrogen ready in the future. In, in a simple way, if we know that, we're, that we might want to convert the networks in 20 years time to use hydrogen, then we might, it might make sense to start selling appliances or acquiring appliances that can be easily changed to use hydrogen instead of natural gas if necessary, replaceable burners or whatever, which we don't have at the minute. And with, with that sort of planning, you could greatly reduce the costs of using hydrogen in the future. If you don't do that sort of planning, and if you do it in one, Swoop. You make a decision and you try to change, it will be much, much, much more expensive to the point where it probably won't be economic, won't be viable to make the conversion. Um, but by that point, you need, you need to have thought about all of the issues as well about people actually having, actually being able to train people to make the conversion, having the systems in place for that, having the gas system, having the gas companies, operators set up to make the changes. So, um, how expensive would hydrogen readiness be in the distribution system? Or is that something that the Leeds project is planning to? I'm not, not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure how much. We, we, talk, we, we talked about, I think it was um, 350 pounds or 500 pounds to 3,500 pounds. There's different costs of conversion. So 3,500 pounds was actually the cost to convert the Isle of Man to use natural gas instead of town gas, which was a, a few years ago. And that, that was a pretty straight decision. 500 pounds would assume that, it's, that you've done a certain amount of planning and, Okay, any, any other question? Yes. 
uh, Matt Pilt from Planet Hydrogen. There was something, Paul, on one of your last slides, I didn't understand, looking at uh, pressures going from around about 80 bar, high pressure system, right down to less than one. And I don't see how you can have a distribution system with less than one. That's a 0 0.075 bar. What have I not understood? Uh, I'm not sure. Is it just more point shifted? I don't know. No, no, it's, it's gauge pressure. So if you take that in absolute pressure, then it's 1.075. There's a difference between two measures of pressure, then. I didn't understand that. Um, so the, the atmosphere is roughly one atmosphere, one yes. atmosphere in pressure terms, or, um, or one bar. So the, the measure of gas is the difference between the pressure in the network and the atmospheric pressure. I so see. it's 75 I millibar see. difference. Okay. And it, flow, it flows through the pressure differences through the system. That's a driving force to move around. Okay, 